Welcome everybody, this is Information Service Engineering, lecture number 11, Basic Machine Learning 2. In this section of the lecture, we will talk about a few basic machine learning algorithms and we will start with the k-means clustering algorithm. First, let us recapitulate what was supervised, what was unsupervised learning. So in supervised learning, usually what we are doing is so-called predictive analysis, which means our data consists of observations. So we have some observations, yi, and we have some data supporting exactly this kind of observation. So these are the features later on, and we want to predict here why, and we have examples. So therefore, this kind of data is called labeled data. And here, the yi are thought as the labels of the data. Differently, in unsupervised learning, we just look at the data to determine and to detect the pattern. So this is then so-called unlabeled data. This is often the case. So often we don't have the labels. The observations are simply missing or the classifications by let's say experts and stuff like that. However, even if we have labels, then sometimes we still may wish to temporarily ignore that we have labels and conduct an unsupervised learning simply to see you know, whether what we are doing here makes sense and is supported by a clustering algorithm. So unsupervised learning nevertheless always makes some sense. Okay, what are typical tasks of unsupervised learning? So for example, the identification of similar groups. So for example, for online shoppers based on their browsing and purchasing history. Similar, also we can identify similar groups of music listeners or movie viewers based on ratings that they have given in some social rating platforms or ratings of recent listenings and also of course looking at the log files at the history what did they see last what did they hear last so this was for example um, determining clusters based on the viewing behavior and identifying these kind of similar groups of course, this also holds for, let's say, more serious uh, tasks, like, for example, we could identify similar groups of patients based on their medical records. Or, complete different example, we can determine how to place sensors wherever we want to detect and measure something with the sensors, how to, de how to place broadcasting towers to get, let's say, a good coverage of our network, or law enforcement, or emergency care centers, simply all this to guarantee a desired coverage criteria to be met. So these are really clearly unsupervised tasks because for them, nobody knows what would be the perfect solution and we need something to approximate that. How can we do that? So if there are no labels, how do we know? If the results that our clustering produces is meaningful because we can't compare it like in you know supervised learning, we don't have a supervision. So to get any kind of evaluation, what we have to do is we have to do our clustering and then to show our results to experts in the field. And these experts then have to read them, interpret them and tell us whether they are meaningful or not. However, in any way, unsupervised learning makes really sense because usually labeled data sets are expensive and we need huge labeled data sets for machine learning, especially then for deep learning. So labeling large data sets is very costly. So therefore, unsupervised measures, uh, methods always make sense. Another thing is, of course, we may have no idea how many classes and what classes are there. So for example, if we simply get the data and then have to do data mining. So this is the perfect situation for unsupervised learning. And also we might want to use clustering to gain some insight into the structure of the data before we design which classifier to use or which, let's say, supervised method to use. So this then would be we would learn about some, let's say, properties of our data. And then we can say, yeah, this makes sense then to use a specific kind of classifier. So these are the reasons why to use unsupervised learning. But let's get a closer look toward the algorithm we want to present today, which is k-means clustering. So first of all, clustering. What does clustering mean? Clustering means putting things together that somehow belong together based on some kind of similarities. What is a good clustering there? We should look there at the so-called internal distances. These are the distances within a cluster. You see this here in the 
um, yellow cluster, the red lines here indicate the distances between or some of the distances between some of the points of the yellow cluster. And of course in a good clustering these kind of distances should be small while the other distances, the external distances, so distances between the yellow cluster and the blue cluster, they should of course be larger. So then we have a good clustering. Yeah. So however, this kind of clustering also is always a way to discover new categories that you didn't see before, for example. Okay, so what's a clustering? A clustering is kind of a partition of our data we have here. And we write this here in a set of, let's say, k clusters, c sub 1 to t sub c sub k, where each of these clusters denotes a subset of our observations. And also it holds that um, each observation belongs only to one, really only to one of the clusters. There are no overlaps usually. And to denote simply that our observation I is part of cluster K, we write simply I is element of CK. Okay, now that's a bit of formalization of clustering. We have learned what a good clustering is. So we have to look at similarity similar things so things within one cluster should be close things in two different clusters which are not similar they of course should have a larger distance so what does similarity mean here we are looking specifically at so-called proximity measures proximity measures we have on the one side so-called similarity measures so if we compare let's say two observations xi and xk the similarity measure should be large if xi and xk are similar. Of course, then we have a high similarity. On the other hand, if they are similar, of course, then the dissimilarity measure should be small. So this is the distance. The smaller the distance, the closer they are together, the more similar they are. It's as easy as that. So we have given these observations in terms of vectors of, let's say, real numbers. Then it's quite easy we can of course use a vector distance so we can use euclidean distance within the vector space we all know that for let's say two or three dimensional spaces like of course here on a sheet of paper or in the real world however we can of course extend this euclidean leisure, uh, measure to an arbitrary number of this uh, uh, dimensions the nice thing is there we get the same distance you know However, um, so no matter what why we are looking here uh, on, on that coordinate system, so it's translation invariant. So if you simply put these two points and simply move it to the rest or to the right, the distance stays the same. However, you see there that we have, of course, to compute the squares as well as the square root. And these are complicated operations for the Euclidean distance, thereby an approximation for the Euclidean distance, so a much similar way to come up with a similarity measure would be the so-called Manhattan distance. In the Manhattan distance, you are only allowed to go straight, which means you can go up, down, left, right, that's it. And exactly that way, like on a, on a piece of paper where you have uh, these kind of, of, of lines, you can walk around there and then you determine the distance. Of course, the distance is not exact in that way. However, it's much less to compute. And therefore, simply to save computing time, so for better computing efficiency, sometimes you can do or you can use Manhattan distance when it's not really important to get the exact measure of the distance when the approximation completely is sufficient. OK, so this as preliminaries. Now let's have a look at k-means clustering. This kind of algorithm is already rather old. It has been uh, proposed, I guess, in 1967 by McQueen. And the main idea there is also, again, they state a good clustering is one for which the so-called within cluster variation, this is something like the inner cluster distance, is as small as possible. And here, the within cluster variation, it's written as WCV of a cluster CK, um, is some measure of the amount of which the observations within each cluster differ from another. And what we want to find there, so we want to find a good clustering, this means for all of the clusters C1 to CK, 
we want to minimize the within cluster variation over all of these clusters. So this is nothing else than the sum of all of the cluster variations within cluster variations for each cluster. You can tell it in the way we have written it down here. Partition the observations into k clusters such that the within cluster variation summed up over all k clusters is as small as possible. This is the task we are going to solve and k-means clustering of course does not solve this um, exactly. So it does an approximation. So the goal is to find, we want to minimize exactly this summed up within cluster variations for all of the clusters. And for that, we simply use the Euclidean distance as you have already seen and we put it in there. And of course, um, if we then look at the within cluster variation of one cluster and we take all of the distances, of course, then we divide this then by the number of observations we have there. And then we get this mean within cluster variation for that cluster. Of course, everything is dependent on the number k of clusters and nobody tells you how many clusters you have in advance. This is something, of course, you have to estimate or there are also techniques and algorithms that give you a good estimation of what would be a good, let's say, choice of clusters. But you have to try out and see and then also minimize for a variation of different numbers of clusters where within cluster variation, for example, will be smaller. Okay, so we can rewrite all the stuff. So you can use here the so-called L2 norm. So this is the Euclidean norm. And then um, what you can do here is instead of, uh, you know, looking at all potential distances between all of the points of the cluster, we simply can use every point of the cluster once and deduct from it the average of all points in the cluster. This is the so-called cluster centroid. So this is more or less the same. This makes the entire uh, problem here mathematically a bit easier. However, we don't want to go deeper into mathematics. This should suffice. So you don't have to do this in, in, in the final exam, for example. We simply want to see how this then works. So for example, let's say here we have five points we have two clusters and we have given here a distance matrix for all of the points. So you have given here in that matrix um, on the side here, all of the distances between points one to five. And these you use then to compute the within cluster variation. And we have two different clustering. So we have a red clustering here, putting three and five in one cluster and four one and two in one cluster and another cluster that's the blue cluster where we have three, four, five in one cluster and one, two in the other cluster. And then if we compute the within cluster variation here for our two clusters, according to the red distribution, we will end up here in a number which is 0 0.56. And within the blue distribution, we end up with a smaller number indicating that this is the better clustering. And simply by looking at it, of course, if you look at it, then you see, uh, yeah, the within cluster variation in the blue one is for sure smaller than uh, the inter uh, the within cluster variation of the red one. So because this is simply the better choice, they are closer together. I mean, with as little point as that, it's easy to see, but usually you are dealing with thousands of points and not only two dimensions, you are dealing with hundreds of dimensions, for example, then of course, this is not so easy to solve anymore. Okay, so the k-means algorithm works now in the following way to do this kind of approximation based on the within cluster variation. So we start with randomly partitioning the observations into k clusters. So k is given, you try it out for your choice of k. And of course, later on, you can also try out other choices for k. And we do a random partition of the observation. So this means this is then completely mixed up. However, we do the following until the clusters stop changing or the change in the cluster is below a given threshold. So we repeat for each cluster, what we do, we compute the cluster centroid. So in the first distribution, when we do this random partitioning, then of course, all three clusters will heavily overlap. And of course, then the, the centroids will be rather close together. But already then, if they no, are not exactly on the same spot, the second step will take place. So here, assign each observation 
to the cluster whose centroid is the closest. And then of course the centroids, if we do then the next cycle here and we compute the cluster centroid for exactly these new partition, then the given observations are already much closer to the given uh, cluster centroid that we have. And then we repeat this process until nothing changes anymore. We can look at it on the next slide here. You see here we have, this is our data. The example says, okay, we, we are considering three cluster, k equals three. In the first step, we assign random partitions. So each point, each observation that we have will be given a random choice of classes between one and three. And you see, this is of course heavily mixed up. Next, what we do, we compute the cluster centroids. And you see here the yellow, the pinkish and the green cluster centroids, they are really, really close together. And then for the next step, what we do there, we assign to these centroids those observations which are closest here to the yellow one, which are closest here to the purple one and which are closest here to the green one. And you see, this is already a much better clustering. And then again, for these clusters, we are assigning the cluster centroid and we are cycling and repeating. And then there are only minor or smaller adaptions. And in the end, we end up here already with a kind of clustering, which indicates in that sense, since this is kind of a greedy strategy, some kind of a local optimum in which we might end up here. However, it's an optimum. Okay, so this is basically the k-means clustering algorithm. Overall, it's an infeasible problem, which means to actually optimize the within cluster variation in practice. So k-means provides a so-called local optimum. So we already said so. And of course, the result that you achieve in the end depends on both. First of all, on k, this is of course critical. We don't know the number of classes mostly in advance, so we try out several numbers. And also sometimes it depends on random initialization because depending on how you initialize the cluster, you might end up in different kind of local optimums, of course. So it's a good try, as you see here, to try different random starts and pick the best result among them. Of course, since 1967, time stood not still. There are several improvements of this algorithm. So one of them, let's say the most prominent, is k-means plus plus. And this improves already how the clusters are initialized. And really to see k-means clustering at work, we have prepared a small notebook for you, which you can see then in the next section of the lecture. Before then, we switch to the next basic machine learning algorithm after that, which then will be linear regression.